Hello, you there, Gail? You stop me screen sharing. You stop me uh, screen sharing. Okay. You want to sit down? I was going to listen for the song. Okay, listen to the song. Then. No, no, no. Can you get just the two of us? Can you get it just as it was before, just the two of us? I've got everybody there, which I don't want. What? Okay. Yeah. Can, so I've done it so that you can screen share. So if you um you press the green button at the bottom, you should be able to do that right now. The share screen. There we go. Okay. They will know that that I'm seeing just you. I'm just seeing you. Yeah. Okay, so you can start whenever. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? If Wave can hear me, if you just keep yourself muted. Okay, welcome to uh, London this afternoon on Tisha B'Av. And the subject of today, can you all wave if you can see the slides okay you can see that on your screen in front of you it's very good okay this afternoon's talk on this tisha b'av we were going to be showing a film but that's how things go and things change today we're talking on the subject of slavery entitled exile to holocaust and that is the slide which you have in front of you now slavery in one form or another has always been part and parcel of the Jewish DNA. It is mentioned either because the children of Israel had slaves or we were slaves. It's mentioned numerous times in the Torah. It is the opening concept of the Ten Commandments and that God released us from slavery and repeated over and over again in our prayers. And it is our major celebration on Pesach, of course, is to commemorate our release from bondage. And there we have it. Uh, and we're, of course, in the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And what better than a caption from the film The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston as Moses, no one finer. Now, all conquering armies tend to enslave the conquered. Whether it is the Vietnamese or the Americans or the Arabs or the Africans or the Russians or the Germans, nation after nation has enslaved other people in order to provide manpower for, for work. And the Jews, the experience of some 2,000 years ago is really no different from what it is uh, some, and it took as a result of three awful wars, which we should never have started, that the mighty Roman Empire was uh, there to defeat us. And our population, which could have been as many as 4.5 million in the world, descended and decreased to maybe under a million, and it wouldn't be till the 1700s that our population would decrease again. Conquering Titus, who would become emperor, took with him back to Rome anywhere between 20 and 100,000 Jewish slaves. The victory of uh, the 70 in the common era, the destruction of the Second Temple, is commemorated, as most of you probably would have seen, on the Titus Arch in Rome. There you have the caption at the top. And there you have part of the frieze on the inner part of the arch below. And there it clearly says, the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem 
killed over one million Jews, let us not debate the numbers, took about 100,000 into slavery and captivity, and scattered many in the Roman Empire. And many would say that that would be the major impetus for the growth in communities all around Europe, certainly in Western Europe. And this freeze here, which had been debated and discussed and written about more than probably many others, portrays there the capture of the holy object from the temple, the menorah, which is probably not the menorah from the temple, but one of the menorot from the temple and its precincts, and is being carried away by the Roman legions, or some would say they actually are a depiction of the uh, Jewish slaves. So our exile began in Europe some nearly 2,000 years ago, around 2,000 years ago, and it continued under the foot of Christendom and the whims of emperors, kings, and numerous other rulers. By the time of the 20th century, it would be described as many historians as a century of culture and civilization. It was a century to be admired. It just after the First World War, Rule 94 of the 1926 Slavery Convention, which was signed as well by Germany, stated the prohibition of slavery and the slave trade in all their forms has been recognized in additional protocol to as a fundamental guarantee for civilians and persons hors de combat. When, of course, you come to the rise of the Nazis <clears throat> in 1933 and thereabouts and afterwards, they had no time for the inconvenience of international law and dimensions. If it didn't coincide with their own particular Weltanschauung, their own particular policy, their own particular worldview, or their own particular needs, and whether it applied to borders which they didn't recognize, an army which they would build up to spite the rules following the First World War, an air force which they built up practicing in Spain, or the use of forced labor. In 1938, with the Anschluss, the policy which has squeezed the Jews of Germany out of any possibility of economic survival over some five years, a force on emigration, a ruination of jobs and of businesses was enacted with unbelievable speed in Austria, especially in Vienna, where the majority of uh, Austrian Jews lived. For instance, Deutsche Bank took over Credit Anstalt, which was originally the Rothschild Bank, and one of the bank's subsidiaries would be taken over by a company that we shall return to, known as IG Farben. Credit Anstalt, originally a Jewish bank in its origins, was responsible for the financing of the building of concentration camps. The policy of the Nazis in getting rid of the Jews rather than murdering them was in fact quite successful for 50% of Austrian Jews were pushed out of the country. But what are the remaining Jews? What are the remaining under 50% who still live there? Is where the Nazis then enacted a policy of forced labor, necessary for the workings and the runnings of the state. As millions of young men in the Gloisa, in the large state of Germany, were serving in the SS and the Wehrmacht. They set up concentration camps and infinitely one known as Mauthausen. Now Mauthausen was an area of immense pits of granite for jam building projects with inhuman slave labor, plus many, many sub camps. Here you have the slide in front of you, which is that DEST, the German Earth and Stonework, who use slave labor. And here you can see the Jews being and maybe others as well, besides Jews, walking up what were known as the 186 stairs of death. 
You've carried enormous weight. You died on the ramps. You died on the stairs. You were pushed off and others took your place. And there were other camps nearby and further afield, such as Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, Flossenburg, and many others. Now, with the work of Mauthausen and its other sites, some camps, the Nazi policy began to become clarified through the policies which they had brought about in Austria. The Nazis inaugurated what was known as an economic policy regarding the Jewish question. Stated the Nazis, it was obvious that only carefully chosen hard and difficult work was to be assigned to the Jews. Building sites, road and motorway work, rubbish disposal, public toilets, sewage, can you mute yourselves please? Sewage, quarries, gravel pits, coal merchants and rag and bone merchants work were regarded as suitable. The model for Austria was emigration and slave labor to a final solution. And here is the slogan which they came for, which was the Wirkung Arbeit, extermination through labor. Said the Nazis, no power on earth can deter us. We shall now press forward with a total solution to the Jewish question. Moss, in his magnificent work entitled Toward the Final Solution, says that the Jews alone were singled out for total extermination. No Jew could claim Aryan descent and be saved. There is a story of Himmler in Auschwitz. Looking at the Jews being pressed forward into the chambers, he saw a boy, the ideal for the future thousand-year Reich. And with blue eyes and blonde hair, he turned to him and said, Are you Aryan? You should not be here. Do you have any Jewish blood? And the boy said, I, have, I am a Jew. My father and mother are Jewish. And at that moment, Himmler said, Then there is no help for you. The Poles and others, peoples were to be massacred and slave labor, but they were not destroyed. Initially, the Jews at the whim of the Nazis and their collaborators believed, they believed that work and even slave labor was the somehow the route to survival. Said the Jews, many of them, work and be saved. He gave the Jews hope for survival, and the hope was an illusion. Work details and labor camps persisted side by side with mass murder. Even the euphemism, as we will see on the next slide, aber macht frei, work, sort of work brings freedom, was a quote from an 1873 work by Diefenbach and was not, did not originate with the Nazis, but it was an illusion. It was a form of perverted Darwinism. For, said Himmler, work the Jews until they drop and any that survive will be then murdered. On Mar March the 4th, 1941, there was a general forced labor enactment the Jews were to be put to working on streets and on shelter construction, and especially on filthy menial labor. Jews aged between 15 and 65 would work 60 hours a week, and they lived, if they lived more than seven kilometers, they could get a bus. But if they lived under seven kilometers from work, they had to walk there and back. 35 thousand Jews were involved in autobahn construction. Autobahns were said by Hitler and others to aid the movement of troops across Germany and also for glorification of the Reich in the form of Formula One car racing. 
the advancement of Mercedes and Audi especially were to be seen as the area that they would wish to advance. And Audi was originally known as Auto Union and they would use tens of thousands of slave workers in their camps. There were many work camps. We see them in the armaments industry and there were Jews working in everything from the asparagus harvest to working at Siemens and Hulse, the electrical engineering company. Siemens employed slave labor taken from concentration camps, especially Ravensbrück. Between 1940 and 1945, Siemens used more than 80,000 slave laborers, mainly, but not entirely, Jews. In Poland, this map here shows here all the camps which existed around Poland. There's no point in even trying to name them, there were so many, but each dot is a work camp or a killing camp. Every single one, dot after that in the voice of Deutschland, in the whole of their new empire. The forced laborers in working for Siemens, if you look on her box, box, you can see the word Siemens. Then eventually, when they established themselves in Poland, this is a map of all the ghettos, not quite all, but nearly all of the ghettos that existed in Poland, and all of them were used as work camps. There were 300 ghettos in Poland and 437 work camps. As the war in the East expanded, the desire of the Nazi high command was to kill the Jews more efficiently. 3rd of September 1941, in the cellar of Block 11 of Auschwitz Barracks, 250 prisoners, mainly Poles, were poisoned by Zyklon B, crystallized cyanide, which had previously been used for anti lice fumigation of clothes and buildings. Degesh was the developer of Zyklon B and the company itself was absorbed by I. G. Farben in 1941. This method was to provide the method for the final solution to the Jewish question in Europe. Labor was a euphemism. Arbeit mach frei was a euphemism. At Birkenau work camp, 160,000 Jews labored and died. On the 17th of July, 1942, Himmler visited Auschwitz, telling the SS that the massacre of European Jewry was now right policy, and two days later ordered the death of all Polish Jewry, except a few fit to work, who would be worked until the edge of death and then gassed. A dozen German firms were used in the construction of the concentration camps of the gas chambers and the crematoria. Tot und Son, Tot and Sons of Erfurt, were so proud of the work they did in the concentration camps that they wanted to patent their creation. A company, Rheinmetall, manufactured munitions, and interestingly enough, if one investigates that company, its history disappears between 1938 and 1950. At the labor camp, moving on to the next, if you just mute yourselves, please. At the labor concentration camp of Mittelbau Dora in Germany, established in 1943 as a sub camp of Buchenwald. 60,000 workers were there, mainly Jews, and 20,000 died in the most terrible conditions involved in the production of the V2 and the V1 rockets. It was at that camp that the German principle was enacted again, extermination through labor. And what of the ghettos? Oh. If you mute yourselves, please, again. 
Mute yourselves. Okay. Lodge Ghetto, December 1941. Chaim Rumkowski, the head of UNRWA, the Jewish Council, king of the ghetto, provided work battalion. He said he would provide work for everybody. The work, he said, was life. He said, everyone in the ghetto must have work as his passport. The Germans, they respect us because we represent a center of productivity. The plan, he said, for 1942 is work, work, and more work. It gave Jews hope for survival, he said. The hope was an illusion. Knowingly, Rumkowski sacrificed the many for saving the few. There were 160,000 Jews in the ghetto in January 1943 who were in fact being murdered at 700 a day in Chelmno. At the end of the war, of those 160,000 there under Rumkowski in 1942 and his policy of sacrificing the many for the few, over 159,000 had been resettled and murdered. Interestingly, in nine, the, where do these photos come from? How is it we've got color photos from the Lodge Ghetto in the 1940s? There was a man, a German, an accountant, Walter Gemmelwein, who took a camera from a Jew and became not only an accountant, was not only an accountant, but was an expert photographer. And he would take photos of color, in color, of all the scenes in the ghetto of which I have left out many, many that I would rather not show. And he took here of many children whose destiny we all know. He became this German accountant, the chief chronicler of the Jewish ghetto. Amazingly, one can read, or I can read, the correspondence which he has as he's absorbed in taking photos, not about the conditions of the Jews, not about the starvation of the Jews, not about the dead and the dying, but he has correspondence with Agfa, the film company that you all know, a division of IG Farben. And Agfa was in competition with the American Kodak company. He involves himself, Genevine, in discussions, not about the conditions of the people, but whether the yellow is too yellow, the brown is too gray, and the blue isn't really there at all. And Agfa involves itself in this correspondence on a regular basis with the Lodge Ghetto, as it were. But when we see this terrible state of Jewish children, this, of course, is very different from the smartness and the neatness of, we see, of the SS and the Wehrmacht and others of the German forces. The company founder, Hugo Boss, started his career making brown shirts for the Nazis, or what would become the Nazi party, in 1924. He himself joined the Nazi party and continued to make the uniforms Everyone from the Wehrmacht to the Waffen SS, and he used for that slave labor. And what about your chocolate bars? What about your Kit Kats and your Toffee Crisps and your Milky Bars and your Yorkies and everything else that you enjoy to nibble at during a football match and at other times? Nestle in 2000. Suddenly transferred $14.5 million into a fund for survivors of the Holocaust. The company admitted that during the war, remember it's a Swiss company, that during the war, it and its subsidiaries of the Nestle Group have been active in countries dominated by the Nazis, and it helped with the financing of the Nazi party in Switzerland in 1939. As a result, Nestle received a lucrative contract 
for a complete supply of chocolate for the German army throughout the whole period of World War II. Next time we nibble on our Kit Kats. In Poland, from 1939, Russia, 1942, and throughout Europe in 1942 and onwards, the Nazis and their collaborators enslaved millions, millions. But Germany was not the only country to use slave labor. The Soviet Union enslaved millions of Germans and others, including Soviet Jews. And Hungary, a rather unreliable ally of Germany, would not allow Jews to serve in the army but they conscripted them into labor service battalions and they exhibited unbelievable cruelty, abuse and brutality and maltreatment of the Jews, surrounding Jews with water and allowing them to freeze to death and other things which the Hungarians, not the Germans, did off their own back. Of all the Jews in the battalions which ripped the young male heart out of the Hungarians, which meant when the Germans came in to remove the Hungarian Jews, there weren't the young men to even consider resisting or fighting or writing or doing anything as a form of resistance. 95% of the Jews used by the Hungarians in forced labor battalions died in appalling conditions, numbering up to around 42,000. And after the war, Hungary said it had lost all the records and documents of that particular period. By 1945, there were 7 million forced laborers in Germany. More than 14 million people had been enslaved and exploited in the network of forced labor camps across Nazi occupied Europe. That included millions of Jews and 5.7 million Russians, of which 3.3 million died. Fritz Sauckel, who you probably have never heard of, was a member of the SS and the general plenipotentiary in the deployment of labor. He worked with Goebbels from 1936 in charge of forced labor. He said, the greater the output, the more manpower we need, and much of it must be obtained from occupied countries. He was tried at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity, and he was hanged in October 1946. Some companies denied complicity, remembering that there were thousands of companies involved in the destruction oh, of the goodness. Jews, and millions of Germans involved in the destructions of the Jews. And some erase the years, as I mentioned before, from their very history. IBM disputed, disputed any contact or having anything to do with the destruction of the Jews, although it was IBM's early form of punch cards, which was used in concentration camps and used in Germany and the Größe Reich for a census and ethnic analysis. IBM, however, made a payment of some three million dollars into a Holocaust fund and did not admit, admit any guilt. Hugo Boss, the man who did such classy uniforms for murderers, formally apologized and he said to express his profound regret to those who suffered harm or hardship at the factory run by Hugo Ferdinand Boss. Seaman, who we saw before, a major user of slave labor. At its 150th anniversary, Siemens insisted it could do no more for the slave laborers and those who survived, but offer its deep regret, as others have done and announced a $12 million fund on top of 4.3 million it paid to the Jewish Claims Conference. But what of the dye industry syndicate 
Corporation, commonly known as IG Farben. It was a German chemical and pharmaceutical conglomerate formed in 1925 from a merger of other companies, including Bayer, Agfa, and others. And it was accused in the 1920s by the Nazis of an example of international capitalist Jews. How things changed for a decade later. It was the Nazi party donor, and after the Nazi takeover in Germany, it was the major government contractor providing for the German war effort. Throughout that decade, it purged itself of all Jewish employees by murder, killing, throwing out of cars, and any other method they could do, and sacking. So it became the most notorious, the most notorious German industrial concern left in the Third Reich. IG Farben in the 1940s relied on slave labor from concentration camps, including 30,000 from Auschwitz. One of its subsidiaries supplied the poison gas, Zyklon B. Here we have, this is a slide of course of the use of armaments uh, by Mercedes and Hitler's favorite car was a Mercedes as well. Uh, when we drive around in our Mercedes and our Audis. There was an aerial photograph taken of Auschwitz, which we'll come back to in a minute. Bayer, one of those companies which had to do and formed IG Farben, acknowledged its blame in the Holocaust history. And it said, I have sorrow and regret. Again, regret. They all use the word regret. And apologize to humanity for what IG Farben, not we, but what IG Farben did to your people. Primo Levy and uh, Elie Wiesel were imprisoned in Bruno Monowitz, which is Auschwitz III, which you have a map in front of you, and it is the lower part of the map is where you would find around here. This area is uh, Auschwitz III, and in that factory where they were working on behalf of the Nazis, was in fact bombed. This is an aerial view taken by the Americans. So how is it, it is asked in more than one book, that if this is an aerial view of Auschwitz III and more, because it's a whole complex, how is it that American planes and others could not reach Auschwitz in order to bomb it? Maybe it's because Jewish lives didn't matter. Of course, the argument put forward by the Americans and the British is they couldn't expend energy, use their planes and their bombs for the helping of the Jews when there were British and American soldiers who were captured and in captivity with the Germans. Go down to the next slide. At the subsequent Nuremberg trials, which took place after the war, there were other trials which took place after the Nuremberg trials, which of course uh, were in 1947, and one of them was the IG Farben trial. And they were involved, as it said there, the planning, the preparation, the initiation, and the waging of wars of aggression and invasions of other countries. And we have there Primo Levi at the top, uh, <laughs> and Elie Wiesel, and of course it's very small, with Cyclone B. At subsequent trials, and the result of this IG Farben trial, 23 IG Farben directors were tried for war crimes as mentioned, and know what they had done, and 13 only were convicted. By 1951, all had been released by the American High Commissioner for Germany, and that is for the company that produced and was major company for backing the German war effort 
and the production of Zyklon B. Let me end. Going to modern days. Most of you have been to Berlin and it's interesting how the events of the past catch up with the present. And most of you would recognize this as being one of the major centers of Berlin today by the American Embassy. And it is a, a famous Eisenman Memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. It is in itself relatively controversial. Many people didn't like the setup, didn't understand what it's about. And even to today, when one visits, people aren't quite sure what to make of it, especially as it's often used as a place for picnic and people dancing in between the steli. Although it's underneath the museum, underneath I think is one of the most powerful of the Berlin Holocaust Museums in Germany. And there it was first proposed in 1988. It was agreed in 1996, not for this memorial, but for a memorial to be there. And then these steli around 2,711 were erected in 2003. And then six months later, in October 2003, the project, having been in this position with 2,700 steli already erected, was asked to be removed. That it wasn't suitable, that it was incompatible with a Germany regretting its past. Why? For any of you that have been would know. It was found that the anti-graffiti chemical used on this concrete and in many other places around the world was supplied by Dekusa, whose parent company was the producers of Cyclone B. And the, after much debate, including the Jewish community, and their desires as well were accepted. In fact, the memorial was completed rather than ripping the whole thing down at some enormous expense. After the war, there were many, many trials. It is estimated if one reads on volumes to do with the Nuremberg trials, that there may have been as many as two million Germans somehow guilty for what had taken place in labor camps and concentration camps. When it came to the Nuremberg Military Tribunal, of course, as we know, very few were actually on trial, and only those who were the leadership of Nazi Germany. And it took a forceful, clear stance on the use of forced labor by making it to one of the charges in the category of crimes against humanity. It was, it said, the crimes of the National Socialist Regime. The Germans, as well as other citizens of countries, were forced, it said, to work like slaves. And when Eichmann stood trial, 1961-62, there in Jerusalem, where so many of you are at the moment, under the subject of the individual in international law, Eichmann was accused with the others of the murder, extermination, enslavement, starvation, and deportation of civilian Jewish population. So I ask you as we end, what were the use of the apology? What were the use of regret of all those companies? What benefit the millions of dollars uh, for people and Jews who believe until it was too late that work would somehow save their lives? So Freelander, in a short little piece, in his monumental work on the war, records at the beginning of 1939, when the Jews of Berlin were already constricted, already forbidden to attend concert halls and theaters, and if they played music in the concert halls, they could only play Jewish music, and they were not allowed to play anything else. And while the music was being played by Mendelssohn, who was considered Yiddish as a Jew, 
They were not allowed to open their windows because the sounds of Mendelssohn should not escape out into the open and infect the ears of the Aryans. When they are being persecuted in this way, it too was at the theater, and Jews were not allowed to see plays or attend concerts, but could, under certain provisions, have plays which were considered suitable and show them in Jewish places for only Jews, or in other places for only Jews. And it is said in the Jewish Kulturbund, was, or the Jewish Kulturbund, was permitted to show selected plays to all its Jewish audiences. And the Stieta showed a play which most of us have never heard of, and it's called J.D. Priestley's People at Sea. Priestley has a sense of oneness with the Jews of Germany and against the, what was going on there and around the world. He renounced all royalties and any payment from German Jews for showing this play, or to be on this play. And 500 Jews filled that theater. It is a story of terror and hope of people in a ship, in danger of sinking, of dying, of their lives ending. But he ends the play on the stage, all are saved. The Jews in the Charlottenburg theater watching that play that night were all doomed. Did Jewish lives matter? Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the fast. You can unmute yourselves and have a chat, man. Thank you, Charles. Up, up to your normal standard. <laughs> oh, Rabbi. <laughs> and uh, thanks for helping. Not only a fascinating lecture, but the fast go a little bit easier. Fine. Are you both well? Are you both well? Oh, Peter. 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 Unmute yourself, Peter. Unmute yourself, Peter. Unmute. 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 Unmute.